Thanks so much, uh, Rahul and uh, the team for inviting me to this uh, great opportunity to connect with uh, a very select and uh, interesting audience. So uh, a little bit about myself before I begin. So uh, as Rahul mentioned, I'm a public policy uh, professional and uh, have worked in a wide range of, uh, of sectors. And uh, what got me interested in this topic in particular is my own uh, personal uh, journey over the last 10 to 15 years. That uh, I studied history, so BA, MA, MPhil, history. Uh, at uh, the University of Delhi, where back in the day, if you wanted to do well, you had to embed yourself into Marxist historiography. And I did so with great enthusiasm. I you know, looked at uh, people like R.S. Sharma and Irfan Habib and uh, Romila Thapar as gurus. Uh, it was uh, quite uh, interesting to me over this time, though, that uh, to find how much of their historical work, how much of their research was not uh, from a place of genuine scholarship, but was purely cynical propaganda written to benefit uh, a very cynical alliance between the, their parties. So most of them were members of the CPI and uh, the Congress I, uh, which really intensified from the mid 60s onwards uh, as Indira Gandhi took over the well, Congress R and then Congress I. So that uh, has given me that my time spent uh, studying Marxist historiography, uh, writing some of my own, and being embedded as an advisor to certain political parties has given me insight into the mentalities behind this sort of manipulation of historical and political narratives. And uh, that's what I'm here to share with you today. So the title of my talk is the neo-colonial mentalities behind the distortion of Indian history. And uh, this is because as many of you would have known or felt, whether it's ancient, medieval or modern Indian history, all of these have been cynically manipulated in front of our eyes by people who claim to be the sole guardians and gatekeepers of history. They say, oh, we're trained historians, we're from the academy, we have publications in X journal, Y journal, we're the last word and the authoritative source on the, uh, this topic. But uh, that's not the case. There's been a very cynical capture of academic institutions within India, and we'll look into how that works. So. I see it as my role to share the tools that the public needs to identify and dismantle these sort of false narratives. Now, I'll be looking at uh, examples from the past and present, so what they do, the techniques they use, so how they do it, the mentalities behind this manipulation, why they do it, and who and what they enable with these narratives, so who benefits from it. And now, why is this relevant? Uh, well, this year in 2020, we've seen calls for a reckoning of history from around the world. And that includes the Black Lives Matter protests against racial injustice. They call for tearing down statues and monuments of slave owners and colonial oppressors. Uh, we've had contemporary issues. So in the last 20 years, there's been allegations of sex trafficking against people like Jeffrey Epstein or Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, there have been initiatives launched this summer for justice for uh, women and girls of the Yazidi community in the Middle East or, or West Asia, if you prefer, who were captured and held as sex slaves by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And Indian eminent intellectuals, as they're called, and their social media activists or slacktivists were very quick to jump on the bandwagon to show solidarity with these movements abroad. Uh, I even saw some uh, half-wit Bollywood uh, actors uh, showing how uh, in tune they were with uh, American culture by doing so. But uh, these same people, when it comes to calls for historical reconciliation or justice in India 
are actively engaged in whitewashing the same atrocities when they happened in the Indian subcontinent. Now, one of the slogans of the Black Lives Matter protests, which has really captured the imagination for better or worse around the world, is that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Now, let's take this and uh, apply it to India. So within India, instead of using this global conversation to spark an introspection into the centuries of trauma that invasion or co colonization has done to women, to people of color, to the indigenous communities of India, we've witnessed the opposite. And this was at its zenith a couple of months ago when uh, a certain Firangi Sahib, as uh, he likes to be known, uh, tried to whitewash slave owners and sex traffickers from the late Mughal period, early British period. So after heavy rains this summer caused the collapse of, the do of a dome of what's called the Mura Mubarak Begum Masjid, also known as the Randiki Masjid, the Horus Mosque, uh, among certain locals, we watched uh, a very cynical case of Orientalism come to life before our eyes. So William Dalrymple, uh, an eminent intellectual and uh, uh, constant uh, figure on the literature festival scene, uh, he resurrected the white man's burden and began to enlighten us ignorant natives of the exotic Orient on our own history. So he tweeted, Mubarak Begum was wife, of Sir David Octoloni. She started off a Brahmin girl in Pune, found her way to Delhi, where she converted to Islam and married Octoloni, who built her the last great Mughal tomb, Mubarak Bagh. She then remarried a noble who fought versus the British in 1857. Now that's a fascinating term he used there, found her way. So three very innocuous words, which say very little, yet hide so much. These three flowery words sure are a strange way to say abducted at age 12, enslaved, groomed, trafficked, and gifted or sold to a debauched Epstein-esque colonial warmonger who kept 13 other sex slaves and concubines. This is just a cunning repackaging of an old white savior fantasy of how an upright white man rescued a distressed Indian damsel from poverty or sati or patriarchy or barbarism a very popular trope in the 19th century, even uh, around the world in 80 days had it. And uh, it's still alive today. But the reality behind it is one of pedophilia and of slave trafficking. And what's funny is that this Firangi Sahib, he discovered this story in the archives himself, and he profited off it by writing a book just a few years ago. But just as movements for justice for such victims are gaining momentum worldwide, he chose to ignore and whitewash that pertinent piece of information when putting out an informative tweet to the public. Now, by this logic of finding their way or finding her way, according to these eminent intellectuals, perhaps we can wash away American slavery or child sex trafficking or indigenous genocide by saying, oh, the African-American community were not enslaved, they weren't tor tortured, they weren't raped, they just found their way across the Atlantic. Or Epstein's victims just found their way into the bedrooms of the rich and powerful. Or Native Americans just found their way onto reservations living in poverty and neglect. And then he was pressed on this. And after a lot of persuasion, he came out with a very mealy-mouthed and uh, ham-fisted explanation, saying this was a period of anarchy and many of all religions were sold by their starving parents or kidnapped. Slavery knew no religious boundaries. As if that makes it okay. And putting the blame not on the enslavers, but on their desperate parents who were starving. So perhaps by this logic, he means that over the past few years, the Yazidi women and children who were enslaved by ISIS and sold as sex slaves, they you know, just found their way into the hands of these sadists 
and this is acceptable and this is contextualized, can be contextualized because this was a period of anarchy. I'm sure that's a great comfort to them and he should uh, go out and uh, promote his views uh, to the wider community. Now let's examine this term, slavery knew no religious boundaries. It's quite a bold statement to say that in light of the extensive primary sources written by the court chroniclers of the Sultanate and the Mughal period, which describe with great pride how for centuries these pious and righteous rulers enslaved and sold hundreds and thousands of kafirs as war booty or in lieu of taxes, or sold them in the slave markets of Khiva in uh, Central Asia to bo boost the state exchequer. This was seen as a legitimate way to earn revenue for the Sultanate, for the Mughal court and sent them on death marches through the Hindu Kush, uh, which is a mountain range. Hindu Kush in Persian means the Hindu killer because so many enslaved natives of India died on the march to the slave markets of Uzbekistan. Now, if we look into the later period, perhaps yeah, you think that, uh, yeah, the Sultanate was a period of anarchy or the early Mughal period was a period of anarchy or the late Mughal period was a period of anarchy. How about the most stable, long reigning Mughal emperor of all, Aurangzeb? So he commissioned something called the Fatwa i Alamgiri by collecting hundreds of legal experts from across the Islamic world, from Baghdad, from Mecca, from, uh, from Delhi itself. And they enshrined the dehumanization and disenfranchisement of slaves as legitimate in both state law and religious law. So this wasn't some aberration during a period of anarchy. Slavery was an enthusiastic state policy for centuries during the Sultanate and during the Mughal era. Now, perhaps, let's be generous, uh, he thinks that the period between Megasthenes saying that India is very remarkable in the ancient period during the Gupta period uh, for having no institution of slavery to Chhatrapati Shivaji banning the sale and transport of slaves by Europeans such as the Dutch and the Portuguese or by the dying remnants of the Mughal empire was a period of anarchy. Perhaps it was, yes, that entire period may have been a period of anarchy by that logic. So I'm glad that we're on the same page there, William. So when they make claims like this uh, and you call them out on it, they say, oh, this is all exaggeration, Minaji, Siraj, Yaudin, Barni, Abu Fazl, Badawni, 500 scholars from Mecca, Medina, Baghdad, Delhi, you know, they're all liars. You know, they, when they wrote all this, it's uh, just because they wanted to make the emperor look good. So, you know, we should ignore what they said because primary sources don't matter. The accounts of ordinary people, of ordinary women, men, children, uh, of poor farmers who had to suffer from jizya, who were enslaved for not paying taxes, who were sold into harems, doesn't matter. History belongs to Firangis and Munchis, so white explainers and their native interlocutors who dismissed all of these records of lived experience as mere exaggeration, and then tell us today that, oh yes, yeah, slavery knew no religious boundaries. Everyone was, you know, had an equal chance of becoming a slave. And then this brings us to the point where they say that this is exaggerated in court chronicles because boasting about inflated numbers of kafirs who are killed or enslaved would make them and the ruler look more pious in the eyes of the ulema of the clergy. Now, what does that say about the culture that such claims are rewarded? Are you saying that, oh, killing and enslaving infidels is integral to their culture, but we should thank them because they still didn't do it in a very high number. And then they had to exaggerate because, oh, you know, they didn't do it enough. And then they had to exaggerate and show off so that, oh, yes, their uh, clergy were like, ah, yes, you know, this guy, he's a, he's a true Ghazi. He, he enslaved, he killed 100,000 Kafirs. Now, isn't this bigotry and Islamophobia from these liberal voices? Their favorite Kashmiri separatist loves to say, Muslims never lie. 
but then on the other hand, they seem okay with treating this community's historical intellectuals and clerics as pathological liars, just because their accounts of the past, their lived experience are inconvenient to the desired current, current political narrative. And then we have another technique they use. They say, oh, we must judge these rulers by the standards of their time. And quite frankly, that doesn't hold any water. It shouldn't matter whether these accounts were an exaggeration or not. Even a single man, a single woman, a single child who's enslaved is one too many. But maybe, you know, we're just childlike, innocent natives and we're ignorant of the ways of the world. You know, uncivilized is what they called us. Jahil is what they called us. Then maybe we don't know. Perhaps, you know, slavery, genocide and sex trafficking is acceptable when it's below a certain number. And it's only bad if it's above a certain number or if it happens to certain people. So that's a nice little window into how they think. Now, what's worst of all is when they say, oh, but we must judge these issues by the standards of their time. And you know, every now and then, then the, this comes out from the swamps of New Jersey, or oh, Rangzeb was a secular king for his times. So you know, we all know who uh, loves to come out and say that. Let's look into that. When you say that, there was a great article by the Sri Lankan uh, intellectual uh, Indi Samarajiva, who said, the nine-year-olds taken as sex slaves by Christopher Columbus did not say that, oh, this is a great guy. When they were being raped or beaten or thrown overboard, they certainly knew that these men were bad. When someone says we can't judge historical figures by the standard of our time, what they mean is the monsters didn't think that they were monstrous. What they mean is that the colonized lives don't matter because these human beings, these colonized people who lived at the same time, who suffered at the same time, certainly knew that they were monsters. And if you had your child ripped away from you and sold, would you just shrug and say, oh, by historical standards, my baby is just property? No. The heart of a mother cries throughout time and it never heals. These perspectives matter. And all of the lives that were silenced by the whip or the noose earlier, they're silenced by armchair historians today. So speaking of armchair historians, as uh, my former gurus, uh, Romila Thapar and uh, Irfan Habib cantankerously spiral into irrelevance, it must be comforting for some to know that there's now some very worthy successes to their past function. So what Trashke and uh, Dalrymple like to see themselves doing is a continuation of what the Thapar Habib school did for decades, functioning as a self-appointed truth and reconciliation commission mandated to protect what's called communal harmony or the secular fabric of the idea of India from us savage natives who can't be trusted to process historical truths in a mature manner without bloodshed and civil war. So let's look into how this came to be. And I call this section the neo-colonial Nehruvian state and its court historians, because it's going to trace two things the environment in which this sort of mentality found a fertile ground, and then the techniques and motivations behind its purveyors. So during the independence movement, there was a very seminal role played in national awakening by Indian historians who had successfully managed to reclaim control of narratives around Indian history and culture from imperialist or orientalist historiography, which was very often colonial propaganda written at the behest of the East India Company, the church or the British Raj. And it portrayed Indian history as that of despotic kings and sad, savage natives who didn't have any cultural, political, military, naval achievements and whose entire history is just successive waves of invaders coming and civilizing them. Now, this was countered very effectively by historians such as R.C. Jumdar, K. Nilakant Shastri, D.R. Bhandarkar, K.P. Jaiswal, H.C. Rai Choudhury, and they put the Indian point of view at the forefront and highlighted that, no, you know, we didn't live in despotism and savagery before the invaders came, 
there were indigenous political institutions, there were the Mahajanpadas, uh, uh, the early noble republics and uh, democracies, there were cultural achievements, there was the Chola kings who had an influence beyond just the Indian subcontinent throughout Southeast Asia. But despite, or maybe because of, the massive impact of these historians on building indigenous self-respect and an Indian civilizational identity, they were sidelined after independence by Nehru and his associates, particularly the ministers of education. So these doyens of Indocentric historiography, instead of being rewarded for their stellar work in creating the intellectual foundation for decolonization, for civilizational renewal, found themselves and more importantly, their works sidelined by independent India. Instead, traumatized by the effectiveness of Jinnah's veto through violence, as it's called, to engineer the partition, Nehru projected his own cowardice and guilt onto Indians themselves. They didn't, he didn't see partition as a tragic decision by the Congress leadership, but as a deserved punishment to the Hindu community for not being what he called secular enough, and thus provoking Jinnah's Muslim League into unleashing such violence. And it's with this background that the Nehruvian state was born, consisting of an unreformed set of colonial institutions, unreformed bureaucracy, unreformed police, unreformed courts, which continued to look upon Indians not as citizens with rights, but as unruly natives, as unruly savages, who needed to be civilized and secularized using the power of the state. So, as part of these uh, attempts at imposing their vision of modernity, the uh, functionaries of the Nehruvian state rejected these Indocentric perspectives of Indian history, culture, and religions, and instead saw history as a means to develop a modern post-colonial national identity on the lines of the nation states of Europe that he so admired and whose acceptance he craved. Now, in, if you're familiar with uh, a scholar called uh, uh, Benedict Anderson, he wrote a great book in the 80s called Imagined Communities about how nations as a concept are socially constructed uh, and are they exist in the hearts and minds of their people. And how do you bring a nation together? You give them some sort of common cultural capital, some sort of foundational myth, some sort of ties that bind them to their fellow countrymen. So with that in mind, one of Nehru's favorite quotes was from the unification of Italy. And having been inspired by the uh, European history, of course, this is where he went to, by an aristocratic statesman, Massimo di Zazzelio, who very famously said that we have made Italy, now we must make Italians. Now, since any inspiration from or rehabilitation of indigenous conceptions of statecraft or civilizational identity, like the rebuilding of the Somnath temple was haram, you know, it was Hindu revivalism, according to Nehru. This meant that a new national identity needed to be invented for this new India and its new Indians. And, uh, you know, as a blue-blooded aristocrat who was appointed prime minister, despite or because of his own contempt for his own people, no wonder Massimo D'Azeglio was Nehru's role model. One of his other famous quotes is, 20% of Italians are stupid, untrustworthy, and bold, while 80% are stupid, honest, and timid, and such a people has the government it deserves. So what was this new national identity and ideology? Uh, at the core of this was the fetishization of Gandhian nonviolence and communal harmony and fostering respect for state institutions. And this was done to distract the public from the fact that independence was merely a power transfer with no actual decolonization or illustration of the sadistic colonial state institutions of oppression. The Nehruvian state viewed the citizens of India with the same lens that British colonial administrators viewed their native subjects as inherently violent and unruly communities who are impossible to govern without emasculating them. 
So instead of delivering rights and justice to individual citizens, our bureaucracy, our police, our courts were designed to protect the state and its elitist values from the aspirations and values of native subjects, not citizens. And now, what made it even more effective than it was in colonial times is that it was armed with a new civilization, a civilizing mission, a secularizing mission. So uh, the Cambridge scholar Aisha Zarako has a great book called After Defeat, How the East Learned to Live with the West. And it talks about how countries that experienced historical defeat experienced trauma and how that affected their state institutions and how that expect, uh, affected their self-perceptions. Now, she wrote about uh, Turkey and Japan and Russia as prime examples, but this also applies to countries that may have on paper achieved victory, but it was a pyrrhic victory, one which involved burning down everything and turning it into a defeat. That includes India getting its independence at the cost of partition. It includes East Germany that got its reunification with the West, but at the cost of its own national identity, at the cost of its own economy, at the cost of its own people. And uh, what she says in her uh, book is that not being off the West or being behind the West or not being modern enough or not being developed or industrialized or secular or civilized or Christian or democratic enough. These are examples of designations and then later self-evaluations that have functioned as stigmas for states. And this stigma really stuck with the early days of independent India. So she continues, once the peoples of the old empire starting accepting this worldview, it was inevitable that they too would embrace its judgment. They found themselves as coming up short, not just materially, but socially and culturally. Objective measures of progress could not be ignored. And that's what is at the root of the auto-orientalism or self-orientalism within these countries. So what happens is they internalize this criticism from the West so deeply that they become to self-identify, yes, yeah, we are so despotic and orientalist and savage and not secular enough and not modern enough and not industrialized enough, and we have to overcome this so that we gain their approval. So then this new civilizing mission was born. The constitution was turned into the new holy book and the recently martyred Gandhi was its infallible prophet of nonviolence and communal harmony. So firstly, the nonviolence myth was colonialism's parting gift. It's an emasculating ideology that's designed to degrade and demoralize the masses. Instead of allowing for a narrative of self-respect or agency, like Che Guevara's, I'm not a liberator, liberators do not exist, the people liberate themselves, we didn't get that moment. Nobody told us this. Instead, we were told that if you beg piteously enough in front of your oppressors, you'll eventually be rewarded. They'll throw you some crumbs or they'll let you live and you should be grateful. So instead of letting the blood of so many fallen freedom fighters who died, who were tortured, you know, who uh, suffered in famines, who went to fight wars of other countries, instead of letting that blood fertilize the soil of a civilizational rebirth, being the foundational myth of the new identity that we were creating for ourselves, the state actively erased the memories of their sacrifices. And why? For the comfort and convenience of the new elite who in enjoyed and inherited the same privileges and tools that their colonial masters did. Then secondly, there's this concept of communal harmony and secularism, which was born out of the trauma of asymmetrical violence unleashed by Jinnah's Muslim League during the Pakistan movement. So when such a group complains about how harmony is conditional upon the other side surrendering to their every demand, that's not a complaint, it's a threat. And such a conception of harmony or secularism is just a code word for submission. So with this in mind, anything that could be seen as detrimental to this concept of communal harmony was 
stamped out using the full force of the state. And that could be the memory of the suffering and sacrifice during the freedom movement, or at the hands of the violent perpetrators of the Mopla Rebellion, Direct Action Day, Noakali Massacre, Partition, or the historical legacy of fanatical and bigoted Ghazis, invaders and rulers who enslaved, tortured, and killed millions of Indians, calling them kafirs, calling them infidels, and reduced them to second-class subjects, dhimmis, forced them to pay jizya, a tax for being a non-believer, and destroyed and defiled their places of worship. Now suddenly, you know, you're not allowed to talk about that. That's uh, detrimental to communal harmony. Uh, you have to forgive, you have to forget, and that's the foundational ideology of this new independent India. Now, there was uh, an exception to these civilizing and secularizing missions, and uh, it's explained by what Dr. Martin Luther King said. The great stumbling block in our stride towards freedom is the moderate who's more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. This negative peace is precisely what our unreformed colonial era policing and judicial standards are designed to protect. Instead of delivering justice to individual citizens, they're designed to protect the state from violent natives. So the sole exception to the civilizing and secularizing mission was the one community that the Nehruvian state was terrified of because of the capacity it had demonstrated in exacting its demands. Now, Nehru at the time claimed that when he passed uh, secularizing laws, when he passed the, uh, the Hindu personal uh, law reform, uh, when they asked him why are not all communities brought under a common uh, personal law, he said it was because Muslims were not ready for reforms. But this rang hollow even to his own party colleagues at the time, and it was criticized in parliament quite uh, vehemently. And the truth is, the state did not have the ability or the willingness to enforce such reforms because they were scared of violence that would expose the hollowness of independent India state institutions. That it was still the same old colonial state and did not have the goodwill of the people and did not have the ability to enforce uh, laws or make people feel like they were stakeholders in the law. The law was imposed from above upon a reluctant recalcitrant populace, at least uh, as how our worthy administrators saw it. Now, Heather Zaki wrote a fascinating essay called The Rise of Neo-Orientalism. And he says, Orientalism, the term co coined by Edward Said, referred to the discriminatory portrayal of the Eastern or Muslim world as barbaric and regressive. And essentially, it stereotypes Muslims as slaves to their environment and their emotions with no autonomy and who will automatically call for bloodshed at the slightest hint of offense. And he says that as far as the far right goes, their Orientalism is, oh yeah, Muslims are barbarians. But the far left's neo-Orientalism claims Muslims are barbarians, but that's just who they are and their culture, and we should respect that. So he says this neo-Orientalism is real, and it's a twisted form of racism inflicted upon Muslims by purporting the caricature that they are inherently regressive and barbaric and undeserving of a respectful conversation on their beliefs as it might trigger them into a frenzy. So with this backdrop, in the 1960s, a cabal began to surface in academia, taking advantage of the sidelining of nationalist historiography. This included Romla Thapar, Irfan Habib, Arya Sharma, D.N. Jha, Satish Chandra, Bipan Chandra, who all went on to play a central role in the syllabi of India's top universities and even the civil services exam. So they were mentored by Western Indologists. They were trained solely in Eurocentric paradigms. And many of them were members of the Communist Party of India which in turn suffered from 
neo-colonialism because it wasn't an independent entity. It was mentored by the Communist Party of Great Britain, uh, the CPGB, uh, where there was uh, Rajini Palmedat, who was uh, a Swedish, Indian, British Marxist historian and theoretician, and later directly by Moscow. And they saw it as their task to write history in reverse. So starting off with the assumption that anything written by 20th century Indian historians was contaminated by this bourgeois Indian independence movement and then needed to be dis disproved. It's nationalist propaganda. It's harking back to an imaginary past of pre-invasion political, military, or cultural achievements. So they, they sought to fit Indian history into a Marxist framework backwards. So they came to their conclusions before and then found and pick and chose the sources and manipulated them to fit into their, their preconceptions around Indian society. And the idea was to prepare the Indian proletariat for building communism and you know, favorite term of the Nehruvian state, uh, scientific temper. And scientific temper is a term that's almost exclusively used during the Cold War in the Second World, so the socialist and communist world. And uh, its uh, zenith was reached in Anwar Hoxha's Albania, where scientific temper was just a code word for state atheism, where they cracked down on the church and they cracked down on the clergy and turned all of the country's churches and mosques and monasteries and places of worship into community centers, sports clubs, and uh, secular institutions. Now, initially, upon independence, the Communist Party of India, the CPI, followed its instructions from Moscow and said that, oh, the new Indian state you know, can't be recognized. This is a fake independence. It's, no, it's still a colonial state. And they launched a campaign called Ye Azadi Jhuti Hai. And during this campaign, they said, Gandhi and Nehru betrayed the people. The Congress was an agent of imperialist and feudal interests. Nehru was creating a fascist police state manned by brown Englishmen, and the constitution was a charter of slavery. This led to them leading an armed rebellion against independent India in Telangana from 1948 to 1950, which was defeated and uh, Moscow instructed them to call it off and seek power through the ballot box instead. But they faced only limited success. And then in the 50s, as the Congress under Nehru grew closer to the USSR, at every party Congress, they would dilute their criticism of independent India a little bit uh, each time. So they went from, oh, India is now a semi-colonial state to at one point as it became clear that Nehru's sympathies lied with the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc, they began to consider a strategic alliance with the Congress as part of a national front of progressive parties and hoping to influence policy. So in the 1960s, particularly after the sudden death of Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri in Tashkent in 1966, the USSR was financing both the CPI and the Indra faction of the Congress, the Congress R and then subsequently the Congress I. So as the Congress under Indira Gandhi grew ever closer to the Soviet Union and foreign policy, the CPI was instructed by Moscow to cooperate with the Congress. In exchange, the Congress gave CPI members access to academic, media and cultural positions, such as the Indian Council of Historical Research, the ICHR, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, the famous JNU, and uh, the NCRT and UPSC, allowing them to manufacture consent for the increasingly authoritarian nature of the Congress. Now, by the mid-1970s, the Congress I had become an establishment bourgeois conservative party that was self-serving, it wanted power, it wanted to maintain its hold on power, which had been hitherto unchallenged. While the Janta Party coalition brought together Indian socialists, brought together the Jansang, 
brought together regional parties, together as part of a broad left-wing anti-establishment revolution, inspired by Jayaprakash Narayan's call for Sampurna Kranti, so total revolution, and Morarji Desai's Navnirman Andolan, the Renaissance uh, movement in Gujarat. So you would think that these uh, brave revolutionary uh, CPI members and Marxist historians would support, you know, this anti-establishment attempt at decolonization of uh, removing the elite from power. But no, the leading Indian Marxist historians, for all their talk of proletarian revolution, were reduced to bourgeois reactionaries, defending this neo-colonial ancien regime from a subaltern anti-colonial revolution of the vernaculars. The Thapars and Habibs, they, remember they claimed that we can't trust the accounts of court chroniclers from Mughal times because they lied in, in order to further their careers by demonstrating loyalty to their political masters. It's funny they should say that because they were embedded in the Indian establishment and Indira Gandhi's Darbar in her court. And they towed the party line in exchange for government patronage. They understood their place in protecting the establishment. And that's why they wrote whitewashed histories and hagiographies that made it easier for the Congress to rule the country and crush any attempts at decolonization by the opposition and its leaders. And that includes J.P. Narayan, it includes Atul Bihari Vajpayee, it includes George Fernandez, it includes Moraji Desai. So a full spectrum of the opposition. So when the Janta Party came to power after the emergency under Murarji Desai as prime minister in 1977, uh, it blacklisted many of these compromised party functionaries who were masquerading as historians and their propaganda books were removed from the syllabi. People remembered that the CPI supported the emergency, even if the CPIM didn't. But the Janta Party experiment f collapsed. In 1980, the government fell. And these historians were rehabilitated and back to their old ways. But by the mid-1980s, after the assassination of Indira Gandhi, they found themselves sidelined by Rajiv Gandhi's cabinet, who had this new young guard and had uh, a record number of seats in parliament. So they didn't need to care about uh, any useful idiots to manufacture consent, they had consent. They could do what they wanted as they demonstrated with the Shah Bano case. But also the money from Moscow was drying up. Gorbachev's perestroika was sought to disengage from uh, financial obligations to parties and client states abroad. While within academia, Marxist historiography was increasingly being challenged by the post-colonial school and the subaltern schools, who often used the tools of Marxism and Marxist theory against this old guard. So amidst all of this, as they were panicking and you know, trying to find a way out of their increasing irrelevance, this academic mafia found one last hurrah during the Ram Janmabhumi agitation, which really picked up steam in the mid 80s and went on in the 90s. And they started selling themselves to all sorts of venal regional satraps like Mulayam Singh Yadav and Lalu Prasad Yadav. So after publishing political propaganda in the guise of research on Ayodhya, which was very clearly designed to muddy the waters around the Ram Janmabhumi case, the Supreme Court and the Allahabad High Court both invited these uh, eminent historians to provide testimony to their case. Now, at this point, it was their final humiliation and discrediting, and it was at their own hands, funnily enough. So in fear of perjuring themselves in front of the court, the truth came out. They backtracked on all their claims. They said what they wrote was not you know, historical research, it's mere opinion. They declared they hadn't visited the historical site. They had no experience of field work. They hadn't read any primary sources. They hadn't read the Archaeological Survey of India's field report. Some confessed that they couldn't even read Sanskrit. They couldn't even read Persian and depended, so, uh, depended solely on colonial era translations by imperialist or orientalist historiographers. While one of them even said, yes, I have this red card and it's given to members of the CPI, which I am. 
So one of the leading archaeologists of our time is KK Mohammed, uh, who was part of the ASI team under BB Lal that had discovered proof of a Hindu temple under the Babri Masjid in 1977. And he said, the Babri issue would have been settled long ago if the Muslim intelligentsia had not fallen prey to the brainwashing by these leftist historians. A set of historians, including Romila Thapar, Bipan Chandra, and S. Gopal, argued that there was no mention of the dismantling of the te temple before the 19th century, and Ayodhya is a Buddhist Jain center. They were supported by historians Irfan Habib, R. S. Sharma, D. N. Jha, Suraj Bhan, and Akhtar Ali. It was they who connived with the extremist Muslim groups to derail all attempts to find an amicable solution to the masjid issue. Some of them even took part in several government level meetings and supported the Babri Masjid Action Commu Committee. Essentially, they went from Marxist theory to mafia theory. Together, this group of historians ran Indian history and historiography as a mafia, making and breaking careers based on personal and party loyalty. And this isn't what I'm saying, it's what KK Muhammad is saying and what many scholars from within the academy have experienced firsthand where inconvenient facts and original research were punished and servility to the dominant narrative was rewarded. So unlike contemporary Marxists or anti-imperialist or anti-colonial historians and intellectuals in the rest of the world, in Latin America and Southeast Asia or in Africa, who were talking about people's history written from the bottom up, uh, talking about you know, how women were treated, how uh, farmers were treated in the past, uh, how people suffered under imperialist rule or colonial rule. This academic mafia instead acted as fanatical gatekeepers who were drunk on state patronage and elite connections and did everything in their power to maintain those. They dismissed all alternative voices as revisionist or nationalist and prevented any challenge from the other historiographical schools. So now, as we mentioned, these old guard uh, spiraling into irrelevance. So what comes next? Who's trying to replace them? Well, there's a new generation of colonizers and their sepoys. So as this old guard fade away into irrelevance, these new neo-colonial gatekeepers of Indian history and culture have emerged. And they're arguably more vicious than before, and they're loyal not to some party, but to imperialist interests abroad. So there's many reasons for their deliberate distortion and disposal of inconvenient historical facts. First of all, invaders and colonizers and their native compradors and servants, they have a very well-documented fascination with the Sultanate and the Mughals. This is because it helps create a narrative to justify foreign rule and alien value systems. That the history of India is just the history of successive invaders civilizing the meek natives who are captives of evil, backward paganism, and who never had any military, naval, cultural, political achievements of their own. And this explains why it was a common European fantasy during colonial times, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that they were rescuing Indian women from evil patriarchal native traditions. But that was just a way of hiding how the British, Portuguese and Dutch were complicit in slavery and sex trafficking, much like the Mughals that they replaced and admired. Now, the, their attempts to protect this treasured narrative which enables them to do so much damage to contemporary Indian self-perceptions, is also why we still learn the long discredited Aryan invasion theory in schools, but we don't learn about Rajendra Cholan and his cultural impact on our civilizational brethren in Champa, Kambuj, Ayutthaya, and Majapahit. So that's uh, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and Indonesia. We don't learn about the long reign of the Ahom dynasty in Assam, or the glories of the Vijayanagar Empire, or Chhatrapati Shivaji's struggle, not merely as a regional leader in Maharashtra, but the struggle for Hindavi Swaraj, 
Indian self-rule, Indian sovereignty. And even Raja Hemchandra Vikramaditya, who was a great general and who crowned himself the king of Delhi, having uh, defeated the Mughals, is reduced to Hemu, the son of the grocer. So any such civilizational awareness, being aware, let alone proud of our country's history, is seen as dangerous revivalism, which might result in self-respect among us, among former colonial populations. And that's unacceptable to colonial masters even today. So secondly, and this is another reason why the original example that uh, I started off with, with uh, Dalrymple, why he pussyfooted around the abduction, enslavement, grooming, and forced conversion aspect of the Mubarak Begum story is that members of the literature festival circuit don't want to get canceled by their own cabal for undermining a very special new narrative they've been pushing lately, reversing which community were enslaved and which were the slave owners in medieval and early modern India with a very infantile, oh, Muslims are now the blacks of India analogy. It doesn't matter to them that Megasthenes marveled at the absence of the institution of slavery and the equality of law by all humans in ancient India, or that the Sultanate and Mughal chronicles took pride in state enforced slavery, or that slavery in early modern India was first banned by Chhatrapati Shivaji 150 years before the civilized British got around to it. Inconvenient truths like that should not be allowed to come in the way of uh, gatekeeping opinion, especially from the unwashed masses. So they claim the descendants of slave owners are the new blacks of India, simply because their self-styled leaders say there's an atmosphere of fear. So this atmosphere of fear, by that logic, what does that make the KKK who claim that, oh, they felt unsafe for their views and heritage during the Obama presidency? Or there's a party in Germany, the AfD, as it's called, the Alternative für Deutschland, uh, an anti-immigrant uh, right-wing party, which says, oh, refugees and immigrants have created an atmosphere of fear in our country. Or what about the uh, white South African farmers, Africanas, who claim to be oppressed and beg for countries like Australia and New Zealand to protect and shelter them, to give them uh, visas and asylum, just because of the fear of having to share political and economic power with the non-whites that they also call kafirs which is now taboo in South Africa. It's seen as a racist slur. You can't say that, but it's called the K word. And they treated them as an inferior race for centuries. But according to this logic, according to this new generation of colonizers, these groups, these racist and vile groups must all be oppressed communities. Uh, that this makes them the true oppressed, the true blacks of these countries, and not the actual victims of civil war or ethnic cleansing or slavery or apartheid. Or more accurately, is this narrative only convenient as a stick to beat India with? So this new generation of colonizers and their native munshis and suppose, by whitewashing the horrors of our past, they empower certain elements who are proud of their history of enslaving infidels and inferior races. To use the simplistic Western analogies that are so popular these days, these were Indian uh, Confederates. They were subcontinental Rhodesians or the whites of South Asia. So, but unlike the US Civil War or Ian Smith's Rhodesia, the proud descendants of these slave owners won the civil war that they started, and they created their own land of the pure, which was free of racially inferior infidels back in 1947 when there was partition. And then over the 50s and 60s, it was purged of all leftist and dissenting voices. And then in the 70s, it was even cleansed of all those dark-skinned Bengalis who shared their language and culture with their Hindu compatriots, according to the leading newspaper of the time, Dawn. 
where today school children are taught about the glories of their slave holding ancestors and missiles are named after notorious enslavers. So some of you might be familiar with the very popular expression within these circles. They say, Never forget that we enslaved you for 900 years. That's quite different to the never forget slogan that the rest of the world uses to commemorate the victims of other holocausts and genocides. Now, these elements are capable of mobilizing prodigious violence against the Indian state and Indian civilians and can be useful assets in the evergreen Western policy of keeping post-colonial and transition states unstable, insecure, chaotic, and poor. A green light comes through from certain foreign capitals, et voila, a media-friendly Indian spring or a neo-colonial color revolution on the streets of Delhi, using threats of violence to bait the state and civilian victims into responding. And when this response does come, the propaganda wings of the establishment in Washington, in London, in Ankara, in Doha, they spin what's essentially basic riot control as fascism, hyper-nationalism, and authoritarianism, arguing that the only solution, the, the need of the hour, is regime change. But they ignore that they themselves handle much milder protests and riots in their own countries with water cannons, tear gas, and paramilitary deployment. So perhaps they're the fascists, they're the hyper-nationalists, they're the authoritarians, and regime change is the need of the hour, and uh, we should uh, support a color revolution or an American spring or a Turkish spring or a Qatari spring. Now, finally, while the world protests to end the glorification of slave owners and bring justice to the victims of child sex trafficking, the self-appointed custodians of history in India, in their infinite wisdom, choose to whitewash both of these atrocities. Because according to their neo-colonial logic, we savage natives can't be trusted with the truth. We're not empowered individuals with reason and intellect. We're not capable of solving historical issues through public debates or courts or truth and reconciliation commissions like other countries did. Through their colonial lenses, we're just a powder keg of various incompatible communities who are prone to violence at the slightest provocation. And the role of the state and a certain enlightened substratum of society is to civilize us by imposing law and order not delivering truth or justice. As a certain colonizer masquerading as a trained historian in the swamps of New Jersey recently said, the goal is not always to be correct. It's about moving the ball forward. This reminds me of the words of the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I quoted it before, but here's the full quote. The great stumbling block in our stride towards freedom is the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Or it also reminds one of the African revolutionary and decolonization icon, Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso, who said, the enemies of a people are those who keep them in ignorance. As long as we allow people with these colonial mentalities, be they these modern nabobs or their mercenary native sepoys, to act as the self-appointed gatekeepers of our own history, our own culture, our own knowledge systems, and we place them on a pedestal just because of their elite connections, the process of decolonization is incomplete. Without massive reform of the police, the judiciary, civil services, and constitution will remain captive to this self-replicating elite's inferiority complex and what George Fernandez used to call gulami soch, the slave mentality. Swatantrata, so independence, is incomplete without Swaraja, self-rule or sovereignty. And Swaraja is incomplete without Swabhiman, self-respect. 
So what's the way forward? How do we deliver truth, reconciliation, and justice? Well, the Indian constitution and state institutions do do one thing quite well. And they go farther than any Western country in recognizing the concept of historical injustice by enshrining affirmative action in universities and jobs on the basis of historical caste discrimination. By this standard, we must similarly deliver truth, reconciliation and justice to the victims of the Sultanate and Mughal empires, state-sponsored dehumanization and trafficking of slaves, instead of blaming and shaming the descendants of those victims for asking inconvenient questions. Statues, monuments and streets honoring these slave owners should be torn down or renamed no matter where they are in the world. After all, as we learned from Black Lives Matter, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And then those who start howling in protest at these efforts at real decolonization in India will show their true colors as supporters of slavery, of genocide, of forced conversions, of human trafficking, just like they enabled the very same atrocities in front of our own eyes when they were done by ISIS in the past few years. So with that in mind, I hope that I've given you the tools and knowledge you need to dismantle false narratives and to answer a lot of questions that uh, have been rising lately, like why do some people still push the Aryan invasion theory despite its discrediting? Why are the roads in New Delhi named after Sultanate and Mughal rulers and not native rulers? Why is the history of Delhi turned into the sole history of India in textbooks? Why don't we learn about Hindavi Swaraja or Vijayanagar or the Chola naval expeditions in schools? Why do we not honor those who lost their lives in the Mopla rebellion, in direct action day, in the Noakali riots or partition? Why does the state accept the two nation theory by recognizing Pakistan? These are all questions that have inconvenient answers, but now you know what the mentality is of those who refuse to answer them. So thanks very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share this with you. And uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. So back to you, Rahul. Thank you very much, Richard. You know, every now and then a speaker comes along who sort of gives such powerful narratives and uh, with such clarity, you're you know, really one, one of them. I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you so much. No, I'm not just saying it, okay? I, I really mean every word of that. Your point about negative peace and that harmony over justice is so, so powerful and so insightful. And, you know, just this handling of Muslims with kid gloves, right? It's actually uh, disrespectful of them as an entire community that they cannot handle... Um, you don't know, truth, if you like. Absolutely. This is what Arif Mohammed Khan has been saying since the 1980s and was sidelined as inconvenient. And instead, you have the All India Muslim Personal Law Board, a bunch of uh, conservative uh, elderly men uh, speaking on behalf of the whole uh, community instead of giving uh, voice to people like Heather Zaki or uh, Arif Mohammed Khan and reformist uh, uh, views. As somebody who has been into and out of academics, and uh, I, I don't think you, like when I heard your talk, it is not a historian speaking. It, it's a contemporary thinker speaking, because this is true for today, whatever, whatever you talked about. What is the way out? Like, I have been asking this question that why are we Indians? Why, why is it that the majority community or the Indians or the Hindus don't care? Uh, and the answers I have got at times is this one, we are too unaware to that all we bother about is our livelihood because we're too poor. Mera beta MBA kar le. This is what Tariq Fateh says, that you are only concerned about Mera beta MBA kar le. That's about it. My job should be secure. Third, I heard a view from uh, somebody in academics. She says because uh, betrayers, being betrayer or betrayal is in our DNA. Hamare khun mein daddari hai, she said. Mm -hmm. And four is like, we're too stupid. Unaware, I can see when I see the youth, it is, most of them don't care. Why is it that we don't care? 
and why is it that it is so difficult to find a way out even today because uh, when we talk about it's like oh no 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 you're rightist you are right wingers you are nationalists nationalist is a bad bad word what is the way out and what stops us all right well that that's a very good set of questions and essentially it boils down to one thing uh culture and human behavior or uh the nature of certain societies or communities are not set in stone they're not permanent they're not god given they are socially constructed in response to the conditions the socio economic conditions that that community or its individuals find themselves in and people respond to the incentive structures around them it's not that x community is inherently violent or y community is inherently stupid or z community is inherently traitorous people respond to the choices given to them and they respond generally in rational ways so the way to foster positive behavior is by creating a an incentive structure that rewards desirable behavior that empowers people gives them the tools and knowledge they need to lift themselves out of this self designation so as as we mentioned in Aisha Zairakol's uh, book that uh, this is the internalization of western or outsider critique of our a uh, nation that we believed the propaganda that they put out that was designed to enfeeble and emasculate us and why did we do that it's because a it was backed up by the prestige and tools of the state of successive states and b there was no pull factor or strong enough pull factor or credible enough pull factor from alternative viewpoints that gave people the empowerment and self respect that they needed so other countries other post colonial countries often had two waves of decolonization the first is a power transfer from the colonial empire to the native elite and then with time within a generation you have a decolonization of the institutions where they dismantle the colonial structures of the state and seek to build a constitution a police a judicial system that reflects the values of its people and serves them as empowered citizens that hasn't happened there was an attempt at this happening in the 70s that's what uh, jayaprakash narayan and uh, the sampurn kranti was all about uh it was crushed very brutally uh using emergency and then after emergency they got 3 years in power they tried to set up inquiries into uh the abuse of power they tried to uh blacklist uh, these propagandists from academia but uh they were only in power for 2 and a half years and in 1980 when uh they lost the elections to indira gandhi uh the congress i fought those elections not as some sort of leftist force but as a authoritarian conservative party that would end this chaos and bring back the stability of the maibab state where the strong you know queen would give favors to the public and when they came back to power they did their best to scrub history of any legacy of decolonization of any attempts that were made they even burnt the judicial inquiries that were commissioned during the janta party uh, government so uh, as a result there's this black hole in our history but a schools don't teach about history after 1947 history ended with independence b people who do study contemporary or modern indian politics after uh, after independence are subject to bipan chandra and ram chandra guha who are the same court appointed historians designed to whitewash history now the very very wonderful powerful insight is on your point about you know the way police uh, responds or reacts you know to maintain harmony over justice i was actually asking the question to a uh, the author uh, sonali chital chitalkar uh, in an earlier session a couple of weeks back she wrote she's written a book on the delhi riots 
Mm-hmm. And I was asking her that, you know, when uh, police does, uh, you know, they do their um, inquiry into the Delhi riots and so on and so forth, how come the Hindus, for example, are taken uh, conspirators as well, right? So there is three, four days of rampage of, uh, you know, stones being thrown at Hindu colonies, targeted burning of shops, vehicles, schools, so on and so forth. When you respond, it's, it's, it's like a defense mechanism. How can you treat both of them at the same level, right? So, I mean, I, I thought that that's part of the answer you were giving. I don't know if you have comments on that at all. Well, the, these sort of riots have always been a sensitive issue for the Nehruvian state because they expose the weakness of our police and of our state institutions at protecting citizens and or even their primary purpose, protecting uh, the state institutions. Uh, so because it's embarrassing and threatening to power structures in the country to, uh, to be exposed in that manner to violent forces that are capable of overpowering the police, that are capable of uh, uh, establishing uh, parallel uh, rule, the state tiptoes around them and instead tries to engage in a very crude form of preventative policing. And that is, don't do anything that will explode these landmines. Because when that happens, we can't protect you, we can't even protect ourselves. And this is why, for example, there has been an arrest warrant for a certain cleric in Old Delhi it's been around for a good part of a couple of decades. The police refuses to serve that warrant, uh, saying that uh, serving this warrant in this particular neighborhood would be detrimental to communal harmony. And what that is code word for is the police are too scared to go there because they will not come out alive. Yeah, I hear there is a Supreme Court ruling on uh, the discontinuation of 5 a.m. loudspeakers from mosques as well, which has not been actioned in 30 years or something like that. Yeah, so uh, state needs uh, the ability and willingness to enforce the law, and that was never seen as a priority. Okay, so uh, Namaste, sir. your talk was really very nice. I was not able to get off the screen. Um, all that Thank you said you. about waves of invaders civilizing us, those uh, nationalist historians, 20th century nationalist historians, that we are, we are all, always very properly told in our textbooks that they over glorify India because uh, they wanted to make independence movement. So they are over glorifying it. You should not really have that as truth. So why hasn't it still now changed? Because it's been many years since independence and it's still there in our textbooks. Well, that's you know a fantastic question. It's one that people ask almost on a daily basis. And it's essentially just a question of political willpower that if you wanted this to happen, you can snap your fingers and make it happen, but it costs political capital. It costs goodwill. And it causes a lot of unnecessary headaches, as some see it, for any party that tries to do this. So there was an attempt at doing this during Atal Bihari Vajpayee's uh, uh, six years in power, uh, the first National Democratic Alliance in 1998 to 2004. And uh, they were vilified for it in the... Uh, in the media, they said, oh, this is saffronization of textbooks, this is Nazi ideology, this is terrible. And what happened in the end was that they spent a lot of political capital on doing this. They uh, antagonized a lot of media influencers and political uh, operatives. And then in 2004, when uh, 
they lost a few seats in parliament. I'm not going to say they lost the election. There was no clear winner. It was a hung parliament. Uh, when they were unable to continue this uh, coalition, one of the first things that the new UPA government did was to undo all of these reforms as an executive order. So it took them six years to do, and it was undone you know, very quickly. So I can see why there's a lack of uh, political willingness to do that again until they feel that they're secure enough in holding onto that power to prevent it from being rolled back. So perhaps this is something that you could expect or you could expect the demands to intensify once a government has a majority both in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha and has the ability to make long lasting, almost irreversible changes to the polity. I don't know how to get that done, uh, Rocher. Uh, 10, 12 years, 10 years or more, uh, the Madhya Pradesh government had made a lot of changes under Shivraj Singh Chauhan. And here comes Kamal Nath. I think it took him three weeks to undo 10 years of work. So yes. I'm not sure there is anything which is irreversible. Um, you know, and governments will change, even if it's, you know, another two terms, but after that will change. Uh, uh, you know, the bureaucracy is so entrenched in this, uh, you know, we have to, because of our activism, we end up meeting a lot of retired IAS officers. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, every now and then they have such a, I mean, a, a, a secular view of, of the civilization, take everybody along and, you know, the same, the same symptoms that you're talking about, of the, you know, of the police really, which is to not touch something which is sort of working. But his view of Islam was so benign and his whole view of was that take the country along. Right. So continue to take the country along. But a view of of Islam, which, uh, you know, as a doctrine, which actually ends up uh, creating a lot of trouble, uh, was was almost washed over as if the country, if, it, if there were to be a demographic reversal in the country, if 80 percent of India were to be Muslim, as if India would remain. And this is a question I continue to grapple with. I've asked several people this question. It makes no sense. The state has to have a Hindu Swarajya view of what the Indic civilization means. And the opposite is so deeply entrenched. I, I really wonder if there is any permanent reversal that can ever be uh, carried out. Any comments on that? Well, I, I liked what you mentioned about uh, Kamal Nath coming into power and within three weeks reversing these changes in the textbooks. Uh, that's one of the issues that there are some parties that are highly motivated about this, that this, you know, uh, this narrative is integral to their continued political success. And they defend it with all the tools at their fingertips. And they'd smear any changes by saying, this is saffronization, this is revisionism, but the history that they've written is revisionist. And it's not about rewriting history. It's not about writing a new history. It's about going back to existing history that you know you have uh, R.C. Mazumdar, you have K.A. Nilkan Shastri, you have Rai Chaudhary. Uh, you just have to restore them to their rightful place that they, they weren't just blunt objects that you use to get independence and then throw away. Uh, it's about historical justice for them as well, that you let a bunch of foreign funded uh, political operatives masquerade as historians, set false narratives and infiltrate the very thinking of the uh, functionaries of our state. The, this is what is true revisionism and needs to be addressed that uh, if you look at the global perspective, in uh, the early 90s, 
So after 1989, after the uh, Berlin Wall fell, after uh, Solidarnos in Poland came to power, after reformist governments came uh, into power in most uh, former communist countries, they were passing laws in almost each of these countries called lustration laws. So uh, Poland is a great example of that, where they passed a law that sought to identify any assets of the previous regime or of foreign governments from their state institutions and lustrated, which is a fancy word for purging, lustrated them. And they saw this as integral as part of this national renewal or rebirth that uh, they couldn't be undermined by assets of the old guard hiding within the bureaucracy, within the police, within the judiciary, because they you know, did exist everywhere and they acted as very enthusiastic uh, defenders of that old system. So you saw this uh, throughout Central and Eastern Europe uh, and any country that had a major political and economic reform over the last 30 years has been encouraged to explore this opportunity and to explore this legislative and administrative process. Brilliant insight. Actually, part of my question has been asked by Rahul, uh, the same thing that he said that it is this, the leftists or the communists are so uh, strongly entrenched and not only in the police, but in the academics, in politics, in historians, in bureaucrats. Um, part of my question was that which you have answered and one mind the question, who was that trained historian from New Jersey you mentioned? Right, so I'll ask the, the easier, answer the easier one first. That's Audrey, Audrey Trushka. So uh, yeah, a video of her went viral recently uh, claiming that uh, she's a trained historian and her goal is not to be correct, but to move the ball forward. And uh, for your first question, I would say as a you know, former sympathizer of the left front and the CPM and its student wing, the SFI, I can say with full confidence, the party is dying. The, the front is dying. Uh, CPI, CPM, uh, Revolutionary Socialist Party, uh, AIFB, Forward Bloc, they're on their last legs. Geriatric, the uh, voters, eight out of 10 of them have switched to the BJP. The cadre, eight out of the 10 have switched to the BJP. Uh, the uh, parties are top heavy. They have uh, an out of touch Politburo who is used to exerting great influence on the media and political debates, but have no substance behind it. And uh, the BJP has done an excellent job at stealing a lot of the core issues that motivated left front voters. Left front voters didn't vote for the party because they loved the Politburo or they loved Marx or Lenin or uh, Mao or Stalin. They were motivated by a hatred of the Congress people used to vote for the left front because it was the credible alternative capable of defeating the Congress in their states. And now, if the BJP can do that in their state, or even, you know, you see the JDU, if a party is capable of doing that, these anti-establishment, anti-Congress voters will switch to the uh, party with the greatest chance of success. So the CPI, CPM killed themselves by UPA1, by allying with uh, the Congress, because that de demoralized their voter base and discredited them permanently. So I don't see a continued threat. They're you know, harmless. They've been discredited. No one takes them seriously. The the issue really is to uh, go back to history before their revisionists uh, got their hands on it. Uh, and also looking to the future, the real threat is not from them, but from foreign funded uh, assets, uh, specifically from certain client states of the West that have gone rogue, uh, that uh, they do a lot of the dirty work that some countries are no longer willing to do. 
and uh, we've seen that in Syria, we've seen that in Yemen, uh, and it's acting in their self-interest to prevent the return to a multipolar world. That for the last 30 years, we've lived in a unipolar world where there is the US and NATO and their client states uh, who enjoy a very privileged position. Uh, they also got to design the post-war consensus uh, at the UN, at the IMF, at the World Bank, and any change in geopolitical relative strength is undesirable for them. They have already burnt their fingers with uh, China rising to become a power capable of uh, matching them. Uh, so they've squandered the 30 years. So they thought history ended in 1989 and now this golden era had come of their hegemony. But now they've realized that, oh, you know, we have a geopolitical rival in China. Uh, we, uh, they treat even uh, small states without much geopolitical capacity like Iran as existential threats. Uh, they're paranoid. And it is in their self-interest, and states always act in their self-interest. There's no morality in geopolitics. It's in their self-interest to sabotage the rise of any other challenges, any other power blocks, any other uh, poles in the geopolitical order. So like with every other post-colonial country, it's in their interest to keep us poor, weak, fragmented, and chaotic, and they fund narratives at home and abroad that deliver on these aims. And the best example of that is what they did to Yugoslavia in the 90s. Yugoslavia was a harmless country. It was non-aligned. It was not a, uh, an ally of the Soviet Union. It was not in the Warsaw Pact. It was not in uh, Comic-Con. It uh, had a very liberal form of socialism. Its people could travel to the East or the West. Uh, they did not engage in wars. They were, you know, you can see why India and Yugoslavia had such a close relationship. And they were multilingual, multi-religious, uh, multi-ethnic, a uh, multi-ethnic country. And uh, even their existence was problematic for uh, certain powers. So West Germany and the U.S. When uh, Yugoslavia started experiencing internal turmoil when Slovenia and Croatia began grumbling about uh, uh, separatism and uh, nationalism or sub-nationalism. Uh, they were given uh, recognition by West Germany, by certain Western states. They were given diplomatic support and that accelerated the disintegration of a multi-ethnic, peaceful, non-aligned state into a series of small ethno-nationalist ethno republics, half of which are now Western client states, and the others are, well, demonized as rogue states. And I don't see why they wouldn't use the same thing in India. It works so well for them in Yugoslavia. Uh, and you can see the fault lines that they're trying to exploit to do the same here.